hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining me again for another Frequently Asked Questions video about beginning with bees. This is Frequently Asked Question episode number 15 and today is Friday, May 3rd. And it's warmed up outside and uh, the bee numbers are high. Everybody's flying except this morning because it's raining again. So anyway, a lot went on this past week. I was down in uh, North Carolina, Black Mountain region and uh, had a good time, saw some wild bees, saw some native bees, honey bees flying around, honeysuckle, everything else going on down there. And it was in the 30s up here while I was gone, 70s, 80s down there. Now we're back and the temperatures are climbing and things are blooming and it's looking good. So let's get started today. If uh, you're new to this channel and you're new to these Frequently Asked Questions series, please feel free to write your questions down in the comment section below this video, and we may get to those one day as well. Uh, normally I get all the questions I need within a couple days of posting one of these videos, and I'm also taking questions that uh, appear under other videos that I've posted regarding honeybees. So this is geared towards beginners. If you're a, a seasoned beekeeper with many years under your belt, you may find this boring, and that's okay. Uh, we're geared towards getting people started this coming week, a lot of people have asked, uh, did I get the new bees yet? And by new bees, we're talking about the Saskatras bees that are developed in Saskatchewan, Canada. They're a cold hardy breed of bee that uh, can handle Varroa. They're hygienic. They are disease resistant. And most importantly, if you live in places like I do in the Northeastern United States, uh, they're cold hardy. So we're going to be doing a step-by-step -step how to set up your beehive where to place your beehive, how to install the bees, things that you need to have to get started with bees. That question gets asked a lot and I'm kind of surprised because all over YouTube, there are many beekeepers who have demonstrated how to start with bees, install packages, nukes, and things like that. But uh, since people want to see me do it, I guess that's what we're doing in the coming weeks. So next Friday, Frequently Asked Questions number 16 will be dedicated to one topic, beginning with bees. And we're going to show you step by step, setting up your hive, getting your package, putting it in and what to expect, when to release that queen, things like that. So it should be a lot of fun and it's going to be a great week and the weather is going to be perfect. You watch. It's going to be awesome. All right. So let's get right into the first question. Comes from Dave Kirkaby. What happens to colonies in the wild that lose a queen and don't succeed in getting a new mated queen? First of all, we're talking about honeybees and, and specifically Apis mellifera, which is a managed honeybee that's non-native to the United States. And uh, often they escape through swarms and other means. Sometimes they abscond, they'll depart from uh, a beekeeper's hive and they'll take up residence in a tree or something. So those are feral colonies of bees. They're really not wild bees. They're feral because they were domesticated and they were under control of some human somewhere and they got out and they occupied a suitable cavity like a tree. So now what happens? And in Pennsylvania, by the way, we have an ongoing study where people are evaluating feral colonies that have been in trees for long periods of time and they're going to be doing testing. Unfortunately, we had a huge problem this winter and a lot of those bees died out. So the colonies that were under study that were going to be sampled, that were going to be observed, and we were going to learn a lot from those, how they're making it through these winters, uh, the colonies are dead. So I don't know how many are left right now, but all the ones in my region uh, died out. Even those that have been in those bee trees for years and years, now they're gone. So what do they do? Uh, often people think that a feral colony has occupied a specific tree or a specific you know, a hole in the rocks or in some structure that's been abandoned, very common in abandoned houses, for example, especially the older houses that don't have insulation in the walls. Those are cavities that bees like to move into and set up their colony and that becomes the beehive. So uh, if the queen dies, you know, queens age and eventually have to be replaced and that colony of bees will replace the queen with a new queen. That new queen has to fly out and mate with drones from other colonies. That's a kind of risky move because that queen may fly out and be snagged by a bird. Dragonfly might get her. 
Uh, she just may not return mated. The weather can turn bad. She could fly out on a beautiful afternoon. Storm comes in, grounds the queen. Queen gets eaten by something else anyway. Bunch of reasons that queens don't make it back. Now the colony without subsequent queens, if there's no open brood to turn into a queen cell, uh, they may die out completely. Now when they do that, um, is that colony doomed? Generally, the actual colony that occupied that hive, that location, tree, house, whatever it is, uh, it does die out. But guess what? The pheromone and resources are so strong there that soon scout bees from other beekeepers or other feral colonies will locate that cavity and find it suitable to occupy again. So often, even within the same season, uh, you'll have a colony die out and uh, be replaced. The good news about a die out like that is Parasites that might exist in that colony, the Varroa destructor, for example, uh, those die with the, um, with the bees. So it's not like the Varroa continue in that colony after the die out and that the other bees that come in get reinfected with Varroa. So uh, it could be, you know, a good cleansing thing because they would die out. And then the new colony coming in would have to discard all the dead bees, clean house, and set up again. So often, unless they're checking and observing, which was supposed to be the program this year, uh, unless you're frequently observing, you don't really know if there's been a complete changeover of that uh, colony. So it happens a lot. And I think a lot of times when people think that a colony of bees has existed on their own for 10 years and things like that, uh, unless you're observing it all the time, you don't know it's been uh, replaced. And so it's just, it's a cavity that's in use not the same colony. So they do change out on their own or they get reoccupied by another swarm. So that's how they succeed in getting a new mated queen. Uh, a new colony just moves in if, uh, if they fail. So that answers that one. And then this second question is from one old curmudgeon. Interesting screen name. Anyway, what are the pros and cons of upper entrances? How can you tell if the hives are vented enough or too much. Okay, um, first of all, the pros and cons of upper entrances. I don't know that there are any real cons to an upper entrance other than if you have an upper entrance, as we have in this hive here, see this little hole? Usually you have an upper entrance in the handhold or just under the telescoping cover of the hive and that's to shield it from weather. Uh, who uses the upper entrance? The foraging bees. So those foraging bees fly in and out and they get direct access to the bees that are storing the honey, the nectar that's going to be turned into honey. And uh, foraging bees come in and out with pollen on their back, on their back legs. And then they go down and the bee that's been out foraging gets the pollen, goes straight in and uh, puts that in cells on their own. And then the interior hive worker bees go and mix up that pollen and turn it into bee bread that they're going to feed to the brood. So the advantage to an upper entrance is you have less congestion down at the landing board at the bottom entrance, and uh, you have a more direct route to the resources. One of the drawbacks could be if your colony is not strong enough to defend multiple entrances, uh, then you're open to robbing. So of course, yellow jackets and even competing honeybees may be trying to get into that upper entrance and they need to be able to defend it. So an upper entrance should be on strong colonies that are well occupied and easily defended. Otherwise you need to shut down to just a lower entrance and uh, you need to make sure that that entrance is small enough with an entrance reducer so that the population of that colony can defend it well. So the other advantage too is venting. So they can vent through the upper entrance a little bit but they also vent through the top and you can increase venting. This is an inner cover that goes under your telescoping cover and here you notice we have just a couple of screws here. Now this is not to scale because this is just a, a training beehive. But you can back out these screws and lift the cover a little bit so you have more or less venting. You can close them all the way down and only have a sixteenth of an inch gap, for example. And then it vents through the center. The hive inner cover has a hole in the middle. And usually it's oval or round depending on where you get it and what type it is. And you can make those inner covers yourself, but upper entrances add venting, but you can also augment the venting by creating shims or putting screws in and things like that. Do not just put one screw in the middle because when you put a weight on top of your uh, outer cover, your telescoping cover, you could tip it side to side or whatever. It's much more stable to go ahead 
and just have two screws and then uh, control how much air you're going to allow through. So that's pretty much uh, how can you tell if the hive is vented or heated? Too okay. If the hive is not uh, vented enough, your bees are going to let you know. You're going to hear them inside trying to chew new openings. Sometimes they'll follow the joints of the boxes and they'll chew out a corner. Sometimes they'll chew out the back. So when the bees don't have enough venting, you'll see them attempting to make their own entrances. And honeybees can chew wood. It takes them a long time, but you can hear it. When you hear your bees chewing wood, it's time to open up the uh, bottom landing board maybe all the way. If uh, the capacity is high, the number of bees in there are high, uh, they can defend it. You want to open that bottom board all the way and uh, they can circulate the air out through the bottom. Upper entrances are not critical because the bees uh, will cycle the air through themselves. They'll orient themselves inside the beehive in such a way that they pass the air over the areas that they need it to move. Critical movement will happen over the brood because they're trying to keep that ventilated because they're respirating right through the brood caps. So upper entrances help that. You'll know uh, if you have too much venting, uh, the weather turns cold, for example, and there's too much venting in the top, you want to avoid drafts. So that might be a good time to close off that uh, upper entrance. And when you have condensation, moisture, and stuff like that building up, moisture inside a hive is good because the bees need it, but they don't need to get wet. So there's a, there's a balance there. And there's a lot of study going on about uh, the cluster of hives, the cluster of colonies in the wintertime, and the transfer of the moisture from the fringe bees that are out and exposed to the cold to bees that are towards the center, and the exchange of moisture between those two so that dried out bees go out to the edges and are not suffering in the cold because they're damp and cold. They stay dry and there's a, a transfer going on in there. That's very complex, probably not for beginning beekeeper discussions, but if you want to look into um, you know, the dynamics of moisture and how it's transferred and why it's kind of bad to provide liquid to your bees during winter, uh, humidity, moisture, the inability to leave the hive and eliminate and things like that can stress the bees. So venting without drafts, uh, and then you'll know again, they're going to show stress when they don't have enough ventilation. They'll try to open things up themselves. You'll even see them chewing on your entry reducer. So when they show you that they need more air, give them more and do it in a way that uh, keeps them draft free, but uh, also allows them to control the movement of the air. So the con of the upper entrance, weak hives can't defend it. Um, and don't let that be too large. Anyway, next one. We have a question here about how do Africanized honeybees take over European honeybees as you explain in your when bees attack video. Um, that's kind of not a beginning beekeeper question, but I would like to uh, boil that down to be aware of the bees that you're getting and what their behavior is. If you're a brand new beekeeper, you may not know if what you're experiencing with your honeybees is normal behavior or not. Uh, when you get packaged bees in or somebody brings them up from the deep south or something, um, always start off with maximum protective clothing on until you understand the attitude of your bee colony. Usually when you first get them, we're going to talk about this uh, in the coming week also, observing behavior of the bees when we install a new um, package of bees. But uh, you should understand uh, when there's a disproportionate defensive or aggressive response from your bees based on what's going around that hive. And uh, I don't want to scare anybody, but uh, you should, here's what I'll do. Um, Rather than go into a lot of detail about that, in the video description here, aside from listing everything we're talking about today, I'm going to put a link to that video because at the very end of that video where the bees attack livestock and chickens and hogs and everything else, including the beekeepers in their bee suits, um, I do a summary at the end of that video where I explain a lot about uh, what's going on and what you should be doing when those bees behave in a way that honeybees under management by people should not be behaving. Uh, a lot of things that are different, when you see Africanized honeybees, if you see this little lower entrance, which is just a hole, this is set up for a, another question that I have coming here in today's FAQ. 
But uh, one of the things that the Africanized bees do, when you start seeing them entering and departing a hive, they zip straight into that hole and straight out of that hole, and they don't go on a landing board. They don't land first and then crawl in the way uh, your European honeybees do. Um, they also are highly defensive. You can just be sitting by your hive. I've been sitting by my beehives a lot, and I can sit right next to them. If this were a real full-size beehive full of bees, I can sit here and drink my coffee with no protective clothing on, and they won't pay any attention to me. If they're Africanized bees, their defensive range is, is much expanded, and their response to your presence is much more intense. So instead of just a couple warnings from bees coming from your colony, you would get uh, a large number of bees coming after you. And if you get up and walk away and the bees follow you and uh, you've got hundreds of bees after you and uh, you walk 50, 100 feet away, even more, up to 1,000, 1,600 feet away, you walk right past your house and across the yard, you still have bees after you, you need to be aware of that. There are other things inside the colony, inside the hive, that could cause bees to be more or less defensive. Um, but you need to understand and read the behaviors of your bees. That's the time to call your beekeeping mentor. Hopefully you have one. Uh, get them over there to check out those bees and let you know if you have a real problem or not. One of the problems with uh, the Africanized bees is they practice something called usurpation. And what that means is uh, the Africanized bees in an area they generate a lot of swarms, much more than the European honeybee lines do. And uh, part of that is when they're going to swarm, they send out their scouts. Well, they're not just looking to occupy an empty space. Africanized honeybees will have scouts that land on landing boards of colonies and they'll test those landing board defenses. If there are not enough guard bees to intercept those foragers, those scouts that land on that uh, landing board and they get by and they get inside, they will uh, start to increase their numbers. Now, once they're inside, they can start to take on the scent of that colony. So then the guard bees are even less apt to intercept them. Those scouts will return back to their colony, they'll collect more scouts, and then they come back. Ultimately, they will show up in numbers sufficient to overcome the guards at the entrance. They will make a ball, they'll cluster around the queen in that colony, and they will cook that queen and kill her. And uh, what happens then is they bring their queen in and uh, take over the colony. It's something that Africanized bees practice, and that's when you can have a colony that appears to be consistently occupied, always had brood, always had uh, good production, pollen, everything. By all practical purposes, that colony can look normal and it's passive and it's easy to work with and you smoke them a little bit and they're calm and you can get in and out of there. Then you go out there another day and uh, they don't respond to smoke the way they normally do and they respond to you in a very aggressive way. And uh, when you open it up, you just get mobbed by bees. There could have been a change. So this ties into when you get a queen uh, you probably should be marking your queen bee. Otherwise, you may be completely unaware that she's been killed off, dragged out, and replaced by an Africanized queen. Those bees show that kind of uh, aggression towards other colonies that cannot defend themselves. So for you to keep your colony strength up, and as we mentioned before, if the colony is not full strength, there should be no upper entrance your landing board entrance reducers should be small enough that they can defend themselves. What you want to prevent is those scouts from getting into your colony to begin with. If they test and they get repelled and they're, they're not accepted there, they'll continue to look elsewhere to occupy a colony and spread out the way they do. Africanized bees will swarm more often than your European bees and they can absolutely do a hostile takeover. What happens to all the workers that are in there? they're taken over too, and they're just made a part of that colony. Because the bees that come with that queen, if they've absconded completely, they'll be arriving in the thousands. Once that takeover is successful, just like a swarm, they'll depart, and absconding means they completely empty out and depart from where they were previously living. They move right into that colony, and by numbers alone, they defend the queen, and uh, until the regular workers, and of course, all the newly hatching brood and so on, 
would know no other queen. So as they hatch out, they go ahead and uh, they accept her. So it is an amazing thing. And we're going to see more of that in coming years because more and more Africanized bees are moving north. So understanding behavioral changes is going to be critical. I know I said I wasn't going to discuss this too much, but I did anyway. Anyway, so you know, observe them. Observe their behavior. Know your bees. And if you're so new to bees that you don't really know if that behavior is normal, get your uh, bee mentor out there. And if you think you have Africanized bees, don't forget to let your Department of Agriculture Extension Office know so you can get a bee inspector out there to look at your bees and take samples. Okay, now this is why I have this uh, hive set up here this way today. Why do some hives have round entry holes and others entry rectangle reducers? What's the difference? Okay, I have this hive set up this way to answer this question today. Um, all of my beehives have the standard entrance. So let's take this apart. <clears throat> this is your normal bottom board and this will go right at the bottom of your colony then you're going to have an entrance reducer in it this is what all of my hive configurations are whether it's a flow hive whether it's a standard langstroth hive they all have the bottom board with this space and then you have your bottom box and it looks like this so when you're setting up, we're going to talk about this this week, of course. When you're setting this up, you'll have a deep root box. You'll have that entrance reducer, so you have control. And then you'll have a queen excluder if you're going to put another box above that. But since you're just starting out, you're going to have bottom board, deep box, inner cover, and then your outer telescoping cover. And that's it. Very simple. Now the question is because, and you may have come across this on YouTube yourself, if we turn it around just to represent a bottom board that is solid across, sometimes it's just a flat board, and then you have this little hole here in the bottom and the bees come and go. The thinking is, a lot of people that set their hives up this way, well if they've seen a, you know, a hole in the side of a building or if they've seen a, a beehive in a tree, sometimes the entrances of course are oval and uh, there's a space below them. But that's a problem for the bees that you are keeping, and I'll tell you why. When your bees uh, die inside the hive, and they do, they, uh, first of all, the round entrance you have no control over. It's either open or closed. So once they have that in there, your bees are coming and going out of the bottom of the box, and there's a space below that, and then of course there's the bottom board below that. Uh, Bees die inside, and specifically drones die inside. When you have a hole like this, uh, the worker bees that are trying to clean out the hive have a huge challenge. A worker bee by herself can remove and discard another worker bee once they die. Uh, drones are bigger and heavier, and they're just in the way. When they die in there, a single worker bee, if here's the hole and here's that space beneath it, that worker bee tries to get a hold of that drone and drag it up through that hole, she just can't do it. It takes multiple bees to do it. So what you create when you have a box that has a round hole in the bottom, uh, you create a dam, a physical barrier, that the bees have to climb over to clean the hive out. And they're constantly cleaning the hive out. Sometimes you'll see, if it, I have an observation hive, uh, and I've seen in the past where there are drones dead in there that they all walk around. Nobody wants to pick up the drone because it's a lot of work. It's going to take multiple bees. It's going to take cooperation. Where if you just have a standard entrance like this, and you've got your entrance reducer. In fact, let's take the entrance reducer out. Let's pretend it's a really strong colony. Uh, you've got this entire width and everything that falls from inside the colony down to the bottom here uh, is on this level. So even a worker bee can drag a drone out by herself and fly off and discard that. When they're dragging drones, they don't get very far. They fly out and they just bomb into the ground uh, not too far from the hive and then that drone just gets eaten by bees or, or by ants or something else. And the hornets will come by and carve them up to wasps. 
So this, in my opinion, is the best style of opening. You want your entrance to be on the level of the bottom of your hive. If you have the hole and it's raised at all, you create a barrier, you create work for your bees, and you have a hole that's not easily controlled. Sometimes you see it on nukes. Uh, nukes are temporary boxes. Nuke is short for nucleus, and that means that these are frames that have uh, a nucleus of bees developing brood. So you have eggs, you have larvae, you have capped uh, pupa in those frames. So that's not set up to be a permanent thing. So if you notice that and you had the little wheel on the front that had a hole in it, uh, and that's off the bottom, in that situation, it's temporary. So you're not gonna challenge your bees. But when you're in a permanent box, and your bees are going to be expected to do a lot of housekeeping, including the removal of dead bees, sometimes in the middle of winter. Uh, when you get that warm up in, you know, in January or February, and you still have several feet of snow, but you get one of those 70, 60 degree days, the bees are going to be hauling dead bees out of there by the hundreds. And if you've got just a hole, you have a huge challenge. So, um, as to why people do it, I think they just saw it somewhere and thought it looked better to just have a hole. Some people do not have a landing board, so they like to they like the look of it, where the bees just fly straight into a hole like this. Um, if you've ever seen ripouts when somebody's gotten into an old house where the bees have gotten into a wall through a clapboard or something like that, uh, and if you look at the bottom of that, uh, it's full of dead bees. Dead bees stink just like a dead animal. So, they have not been hauling those dead bees out of there. So you need to facilitate that because in your managed colony, you want them to be able to clean the house and keep a tidy environment. And the best way to do that is to have a landing board with an entrance on the same level so they can drag everything out nice and easy. Mandy Terry, frame spacing in honey supers or even removing a frame from the brood boxes does a slatted rack need to line up. First of all, you may not know what a slatted rack is, so we're going to talk about that too. But what happens is some people, and usually this is in the honey super, by the way, when you look inside a hive, you have all the frames in there. This is a replica of a 10 frame Langstroth hive. So there are 10 frames lined up. Sometimes people will remove a frame and they even sell guides for this uh, so that you can get them equidistant. I think that's unnecessary. But then what you'll do is you'll, you'll space out all the frames. And this is actually a rare thing to do in the brood box. Why would you take a frame out of the brood box and extend the comb? Deeper comb made by the bees does not result in larger bees. It, uh, so if you have a 10 frame or an eight frame box, Here's the box and 10 or eight is just based on the number of frames it's built to accommodate. So having a 10 frame box for brood should stay a 10 frame brood box. The only advantage to having a frame removed is so that you can have these frames all centered. And then when it comes time to get into the hive, get into the bees to check out what's going on there, you can go to the side pry these open and pull a frame over. Then once it's clear of the other frame, you can lift it straight out and then you're gonna put that on a frame holder. Now what you can do is as you look at the other subsequent frames, you have the space to pull them sideways and look them over, pull them sideways, look them over. When you find what you are looking for, if you're looking to see if they have brood, if you're looking to see if you have uh, pupae, eggs, whatever, then that's it. Push everything carefully back, sideways without pulling and sliding back in. Replace that first frame that you pulled out. Close up that box. Okay, now let's go up a level. So remember, so this is your brood. You might have a queen excluder over the brood. Then you've got a super. You've got a surplus honey box. Now let's say that this is also 10 frame, which it is. What's the advantage of pulling out one of those frames? If you pull out one of these and now you spread them all out, you do end up with deeper cells and you do end up with each frame holding more honey. 
So you have longer wax cells. There, there is some economy of wax because it's easier for the bees to fill a deeper cell than it is to have multiple shallow cells, if that makes sense. Fewer caps, less work for the bees, deeper frames, but you have an uneven number. So now we have nine frames. So if you've got a spinner, if that's what you do, if you uncap and uh, spin your frames out, you generally want even numbered frames because most beginners have a two frame or a four frame extractor. So that's another thing to think about. But uh, now that you've got that space in there, you uh, have more space to work and you have deeper comb and you can harvest more wax if you want to do that. And it's easier on the bees. So, oh, slatted rack. Does that need to line up? So you may not know, what's a slatted rack? This is a full-size version, of course, of a slatted rack, and this would normally go right under the brood box in the bottom. And you notice that this is a 10 frame. So there are 10 of these. Each one of these slats lines up with one of your frames. And the reason is the bees can travel in and out right through this. They come out under it and they go in and out under the landing board. So um, does it matter that your frames no longer line up with these? Because some people say that you want Varroa when they get groomed off and small hive beetles when they're being chased out to fall between everything and not land on that slatted rack. They want them to go straight to the bottom board and then out or straight to a screen bottom board and through to the ground. So no, it's not critical that they don't line up. There's still a space there. If it hits the bottom, the bees have access to everything. They'll just drive out the Varroa or the small hive beetles, whatever it is, and they'll get them right out of the colony just the same. It is more efficient if your slatted rack lines up with all of your frames and the bees travel in and out without having to go around or over anything. Uh, the more direct routes we provide for the bees, the better. The easier we make it for them to clean up their hive, the better. But if there's bee space and they can get over the slatted rack and around it and, and access everything, it, you can still do that. So if you really want to pull the racks, of course, based on what I've just explained here, there's no reason to pull frames uh, and have deeper cells in the brood box. Uh, it's only an advantage when you're talking about your honey super. So if that doesn't line up, it's not the end of the world. It just reduces a little bit of the efficiency. And uh, that's that question. Number six is by Grayson Smith. How do you strain or filter honey? Okay. How do I personally do it? I think uh, most people know that I don't. So <laughs> I did a recent demonstration where I took some, uh, I was demonstrating this on capper and I decided instead of just uncapping with it, I scraped out all of the wax and all of the honey and I put it into a standard strainer, vegetable strainer that you would have in your kitchen sink. And uh, we just put that in a hot box. So I let the sun heat it up and we drain the honey out of it. That is the most filtering that I do. For those of you who have seen my other videos, I have a pile of flow hives and I use flow hives to extract my honey. If you don't know what a flow hive is, it's a mechanized frame. That's what's up here behind me. These are uh, plastic frames that the bees fill up the honey cells that when you shift the uh, frame with a, a key that sticks in the top, they shift like this and the honey drains through these channels all the way through the bottom, out the back and into a jar. And then you have a jar of honey. It's raw honey. It's unfiltered. It is frame by frame directly into jars and uh, any particulates that are in it would be wax and propolis. There are no bee parts. And uh, all of that is edible for people. So it's really a matter of personal preference. If you want to strain out bits of uh, wax and propolis and things like that, there are bucket strainers that sit right over a plastic five gallon bucket. You can pour your honey through that and it will collect those little bits and pieces. But the way I do it, it's totally not required. You don't, you don't have to strain anything out of your honey unless it freaks you out to have little particles in your honey that normally float to the top anyway, so you can scrape them off. But if you little bits of propolis, some people eat propolis for health and nutrition. Some people eat bits of wax. Everything that comes through in that honey would be considered edible by people. So personally, I don't do any straining or filtering 
Uh, the most basic straining would be the stainless steel um, vegetable strainers that you put on your sink. I'll put a link to that down below so you can see what it is. And uh, that's it. Now, maybe that honey with more particulates in it uh, would be apt to crystallize or solidify in the jar. That's not the end of the world either, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because you can reheat it a little bit. You can get that up to 110 degrees and, and remelt the honey and reconstitute it so that you can use it as a liquid, or you can just scoop it out and use it as a semi-solid. So I personally don't strain anything. And... Uh, Next one is from Carlos Murphy, frequent commenter, Carlos. Thank you, as always. Anyway, uh, do I have small, oh, do I have small hive beetle issues? And uh, have I heard of the nematodes? Okay, yes, I've heard of the nematodes. Uh, considering the weather where I live and uh, the way my bees are, remember I have the varroa resistant hygienic bee lines and now we're gonna test out Bee Weaver are the bees I've always used. I'll put a link to them down in the video description. Excellent bees. A lot of my viewers have bought Weaver bees this year already and they're already doing fantastic. So those of you who are giving us updates on the bees and how they're doing, that's really good to know because I like to know that I'm steering people in the right direction. I like to know that they're doing great things. And as uh, you've already heard from me today, we're going to be doing uh, Saskatras bees. So I'll have weaver bees and I'll have Saskatras bees uh, in my apiary starting in the coming week. So they do a great job of routing small hive beetles out. Now I've been, uh, I have not Varroa boards, but I have sliding trays underneath that are nice and deep. I probably should show those in one of these videos and they're segmented off and they're under the Flow Hive 2 configurations. And I put uh, sticky mouse traps down in there. And uh, I catch if they're, if they're grooming off a row or whatever, I can look at those little sticky traps. I can see them up close They're on a white background. I can put them under a microscope. I do have dead bees with Varroa on them. So I need to show you some micro photos of those. I have them all in Petri dishes. They're all drying out. Uh, it was very interesting because when the bee died, the mite died right on it and stayed put. The mite didn't leave. Interesting there too. Uh, so I'm going to show some good photos of those. I have everything I need for that. But I found one small hive beetle. So do I have a problem with small hive beetles? I really don't. Uh, the most I've ever seen is like one or two beetles. By the way, they call those things small hive beetles. Those things are big. That's like a third the size of a worker bee. And uh, they're easy to spot. I also have my Swiffer dusters in there, also in the, in the trays because I want to catch those and see what they look like. But the small hive beetles where I live, uh, they're out there. I mean, they're around. I got one. So I got one. Uh, you see them in the top, all the way back in the corner, one or two maybe, and on the landing board, all the way in the back where the bees uh, kind of push them out. They, um, they're supposed to show up there. Other people in my area have said they've, they've had small hive beetles. I personally have a hard time finding them because I want to photograph them and I want to look at them up close. Um, also, I'm going to try to catch some in those beetle jails, they're called. Same company that makes the swarm trooper um, swarm trap also make something called a beetle jail that uh, slides down in between the frames and you can catch some beetles. So I've, uh, as of today, I ordered some of those and paid full price. They're not giving them to me for nothing. And uh, I'm going to evaluate those to see, maybe I'm just not seeing the small hive beetles. Maybe the bees are getting them out so fast that I don't get to see them. So I'm going to put traps in there and see if I can get some, get a close look and share that with you. But the nematode end of it, Nematodes are parasites that go directly after small hive beetle developing larvae. So the life cycle of small hive beetle, you know, the adult beetles can fly. They have those little club antenna, just like uh, Japanese beetles do. And they, they smell everything in the air and their the little club antennas orient towards beehives and they can smell the, um, the pollen that's being stored in there because that's mixed with uh, honey and it's fermenting and it puts on its own odor, puts out its own odor. And then those small hive beetles fly into your beehive. So the bees have to stop them at the landing board. I'm assuming my bees are stopping them at the landing board. I don't see the small hive beetles, so I don't know. 
but that's how they do it. They home in, but then they go through their life cycle. So they're going to lay eggs in there. Their eggs are going to hatch and their eggs are going to be little worms, little white worms that come out. And they're either going to drop through the bottom if you've got screen bottoms or they're going to come right out the front and they're going to drop into the ground and then they're going to pupate in the ground. And that's when they come out as adult beetles ready to fly again and go anywhere. Thank goodness the Varroa mites can't fly. They need to attach themselves to a bee and the bee transports the Varroa mite. The small hive beetle can fly. I think our blessing where I live is that the weather is so bad that uh, they just don't do very well. The other thing is my chickens roam through my apiary all day long. You know, there's always one or two chickens cruising through there. If you saw my previous uh, video that I put up this week uh, on how to support your beehives on iron tea posts, that creates an area where the chickens walk freely underneath. They can scratch the ground if they want to. If they find nematodes, not nematodes, if they find those uh, worms of the small hive beetle, they're going to eat them, whether they're on their way down or on their way up. The thing is, those, those worms are going to travel at night. So I think having a healthy wild bird population is a big help. I think having chickens is a big help and cold weather is a big help. Now, if I put those nematodes into the water, nematodes will come in suspension and you'll pour them right onto the ground near your beehives. You better be sure that you have a small hive beetle larvae first. The nematodes are just going to die out. They actively seek and destroy. So they will hunt out the beetle larvae. So in that way, they're fantastic. Uh, but then again, if you don't have the small hive beetles and their larvae, then the things that depend on them, like those nematodes, will not uh, survive. So you need to know you have them so you can feed them. If any of you are using the nematodes, and I don't know how you prove that they work, other than that you've got to die off a decline in numbers of your small hive beetles, then uh, share that down in the video. If you've made a video showing, you know, some success, some scientific thing, we know scientifically that that does work. Uh, there are biologists that have done those tests that, that show that it really does work. They do actively seek out the small hive beetle larva stage. But uh, so far, I don't need them because we just don't have it. I know that they can ruin your honey. I've seen pictures. I've seen the slime doubt, you know, honey, especially when the, the bees have died out and people have just left all their honey on and small hive beetles have taken over and uh, just ruined it. Uh, that's never happened for me either. Thank goodness. I, I heard it's it's terrible and that the bees won't even clean that up. Like if, if you put, that's one of the reasons too, don't take frames from one beehive and stick them in another. When there's been a die out, you don't know what's going on. And if they're slimy from small hive beetles, I guess that's terrible. So um, I'm going to be testing out beetle gels. If you've been using the nematodes, let me know how that worked. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting area and I appreciate that question. Next one is from, I hope I say this right, Mihai, M-I-H-A-I. Do you use a locking system between the boxes? This is a very common thing that new beekeepers, uh, uh, I know it, it doesn't seem to make sense that you've got this bottom board and then we've got a brood box that you just set on it and then you've got, you know, your super later that you're just going to set onto that and you're going to have a queen excluder or whatever. Uh, why don't we have to strap that down? Shouldn't we be clasping these together? Instinctively, it seems right. We would have some kind of buckle system to clamp that on, especially the bottom board. I do have bottom boards uh, bracketed to my uh, deep brood boxes, but that's because those are swarm boxes and they're going to be transported. Uh, what happens is once you set that box on there, once you have bees in there, the bees go along and they use propolis, which they get from pine trees, spruce trees, maples, whatever. And uh, that's bee glue. And they're going to seal that up. When you see this dark umber, amber colored substance that it can be pretty hard, it solidifies in there. And that's what you're scraping too. When you put your hive tool in between your boxes and you have to pry away the material that's gluing that together, that's a combination of propolis and beeswax. And that's how these boxes are held together. So when you first stack them, stack them carefully, make sure it's nice and level, and then get them lined up great on the bottom board because once the bees get in there, they're gonna start sealing up all those edges. So no, I don't use any clasps at all. Uh, I think he put a, a link on his question 
to show that uh, uh, there's a, a clip method. I've seen them on other hive designs, especially the big plastic hives. I've seen that they have built-in clamps that draw them together and hold them tight. And I think that's because with those designs, the bees don't really glue them up the way they do with the wooden boxes. And uh, so they're not necessary. And it's why you don't see them. Uh, when it comes time to transport hives, most people just strap them down. And uh, migratory beekeepers, those who are providing pollination services, they don't have any, you know, clasps or clamps or anything on the sides of the boxes because they need them all to push right up against one another and then they just strap them together on a pallet or something like that. So it is not necessary to do that. Okay, so that's it. Those are all my questions for today. I have a lot of work to do because I have a lot of new bee boxes that I'm putting together just for the arrival of the bees coming this week. Reminder that Frequently Asked Questions number 16 next week will be dedicated just to the Saskatrass bees and how to set up your hive, how to install them, when to release your queen, and how they're doing. What I think. Somebody else wrote recently that they got those Saskatrass bees and she said they're smaller than the European honeybees and that they're able to go out through little vent holes and things like that that her normal European honeybee lines could not do. I'm going to be paying attention to that because it's very interesting. If they actually turn out to be really tiny bees, that's going to be uh, something that we'll share and talk about. So look forward to that. Thank you for watching. If you have questions, please write them down in the comment section below this video. And thank you for spending your time with me today. And there is a link, of course, at the end that shows all of these uh, frequently asked videos as a playlist. So have a great weekend and enjoy your honeybees. I hope the weather is fantastic. Thanks for watching as always.